All right, we are live. All right, hey guys, we're so glad you could join us tonight for our first ever live chat with First Teams. There's going to be many more of these to come, but uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, just some quick introductions. We have Brian over here, woohoo! <laughs> Kyle in the middle, and Jason over here on our other side. Um, so kind of how the evening's going to work is, as lots of you know, you have questions that you've already pre-submitted. Um, so we're going to try and make it through as many as those. But at the same time, if you guys have any questions about what our techs are saying or you want them to explain it in further uh, depth, then just be sure to chat uh, there on your right-hand side of your screen. Uh, type in any questions, and we'll be sure to monitor those throughout the evening. Um, again, just we hope you have lots of fun, and uh, just ask us anything you guys want. So enjoy. We'll wait, we'll wait a little bit so we can get into this. Okay. So I'm going to get into it. Yep. Okay. Well, we've got some questions that were submitted uh, online. So I guess I'll go ahead and start talking about the servos and some of those related issues and questions that you had. Um, one team asked about um, some servo shaking and things with Arduino and what they could do to resolve that. Um, my thought is, and I'm, I'm not uh, too up on Arduino, that's kind of Jason's territory, but you know, I think it's probably a power issue that's going on. I think it's probably a limited number of uh, amps that's available through your microcontroller. So if you can actually send power to your servo independent of that microcontroller, it's probably going to clear it up. Uh, Jason, can you add in? Yeah, the, well, the maximum amp uh, amperage that you can draw from any particular pin on an Arduino is about 40 milliamps. You're going to exceed that really quickly. And if you do, you're going to uh, reboot the board, which can create erratic behavior. Um, also, if you have your uh, servo plugged into a pin that is also connected to an LED on the board, um, and that LED will flash when you power up the board, um, you'll see some erratic movement when the board powers up. So make sure you're using a PWM pin, but make sure you're using a PWM pin that's not also connected to an LED on the board. OK, next question. Um, how do you recommend balancing servo controller amperage on the robot to stay below FTC limit? You know, it really depends on your controller and what it does. If it allots a certain amount of amperage per channel, um, you know, then uh, basically you don't have to worry too much about it. You can grab a servo that's going to pull more amps than, uh, than what you actually have allotted to that channel. It's just going to limit your torque on that servo. Um, just make sure your controller, if you pull more amps than what's available, or if you're trying to anyways, it's not going to burn out that channel or mess anything up. So make sure it's really well protected. Another question we have here, obviously a lot of questions relating to servos, and Kyle is kind of our servo guru as well as, and then we got the control uh, guy over here, uh, Jason. So, you know, some of the questions are related uh, regarding uh, the power of servos, and Kyle can maybe get into some of these servos here as I can maybe open some of them up, a lot of the servos that are being used by a lot of the teams. So, so can you talk a little bit about power of servos sure. and how, how the power is stated? Sure. So. Well, the most popular by far, the ones that I've seen, is going to be a, a 485HB. It's an analog servo. I've actually got a, a long YouTube video. Uh, if you guys want to watch that, um, you know, there's probably a lot more information than what you need. But go ahead and check that out. Um, I think this one has, what is it, around 86 ounce inches? I believe so, yes. Somewhere yeah. around there. It runs yeah. on 4.8 to 6 volts. Um, so it's completely legal with FTC. This servo on your modern robotics controller is going to rotate about 150 degrees, given the 750 to 2250 microsecond signal that you guys can send out this year. If that signal is wider, you'd be able to get 180 out of this servo just by overdriving it. Um, you'll notice on our website that we may say stock 90. Well, we come from more of an RC background, or that's kind of how we started anyways. And so that was with a 1050 to 1950 microsecond pulse width range. Uh, so much more narrow range. But if you send that wider range, you'll get more rotation out of it. Um, another one of my favorite servos, I'm going to jump over to this right. continuous servo. Uh, this is actually a new servo from high tech. It's a 2645CR servo, which means continuous rotation. Um, basically, this is a lot different than any other servo out there, or a lot different than your 485 just due to the fact that it doesn't have any positioning feedback. So when you send a signal other than 1,500 microseconds, this is going to start rotating. And it doesn't have any stops. It can just rotate around and around, just like a motor would. Uh, the further you deviate from 1,500 microseconds, the faster this thing's going to run. Um, and it is bidirectional, like all servos are. So above 1,500 is going to be clockwise. Below 1,500 is going to be counterclockwise. 
and kind of <laughs> digital difference between the digital and the analog, I guess. Okay. Um, so I touched on the 485 HB. The 5485 HB is almost identical to the 485, except is digital. Uh, that means it has more resolution. It's going to respond to a signal a little bit quicker, so it's going to be able to process that signal and uh, and start to move to position a little bit faster. The transition rate is about the same speed, though. Uh, the main difference on this is you can plug it into a high-tech servo programmer, and you can really tailor this servo to what you're wanting to do. So, for example, uh, if I had my modern robotics controller and I wanted to adjust how many degrees this thing rotates, given that 750 to 2250 signal, I could just change the endpoints on this and get up to 180 out of it. There's no modification inside of the servo. I'm not adding resistors or anything like that. It's just a programming change, and this servo is intended to be programmed. So I believe that's 100% legal. Uh, I think it was post 36 or something like that on one of the threads. So. Uh, FTC has said that programming is legal. Looks like we're getting some questions in uh, from uh, all the teams out there. Uh, one of them uh, says, will you guys be able to provide CAD files for the different linear slides and C channels? Our team is using Autodesk, and we couldn't find the correct file anywhere. I guess Kyle could probably answer that question. Okay. So. Almost all of the parts that we have online uh, are available with a step file. So that's a 3D file format. It's compatible with most of your 3D software. Um, so you might be able to drop that into your AutoCAD or whatever you're using and uh, get that to work for you. As far as the acetyl slides, um, those are not released on our website. Um, Brian, I'll have you touch on that and talk about the channel slides. Yeah, the channel slides, there's so many different ways to build slide mechanisms. And I'll get into some of them here in just a little bit. You know, we're um, Unfortunately, there's no best way, quote, best way to, to build systems. So it really kind of comes down, if you're wanting to build a heavy-duty system, obviously the systems become much heavier. You can run a belt systems. You can run, you know, obviously linear ball bearing systems like this one here. This is, we built basically a singular system here um, that runs right down inside the channel. I don't know if some of you can see that or not. Um, but as far as, uh, we've got a lot of questions as far as how to drive uh, your slide systems. And so once again, I hate to be vet, rather vague on that, but, and I'm gonna touch, touch base on several of our various components that will allow you to do that here in just a little mm -hmm. bit. So, but, but yeah, there's many different ways. If you're building a really heavy duty system as well, you can go with twin systems on either side. That way you're running one channel, but you're basically running on either side of the channel with your, with your eight millimeter or 12 millimeter rod. So it works at, build a very heavy duty system. And Kyle just brought around a, a good okay. way to build a linear slide. Well, I wanted to bring this because the, the question was somewhat specific to the acetyl pieces okay, gotcha. that slide down the channel. Um, and they were asking about CAD, CAD files for those. So if you okay. want to touch on that and kind of talk about the different styles of them. Yeah, well, we've got several different styles of the acetyl slide. Uh, this, this slide right here basically is going to clamp on two sides. Works great for camera applications. But if you're wanting to do something a little more heavy duty, we actually have them actually clamp around three different sides or three sides, but also all four slide <laughs> sides. So as you can see here, we have a 785 servo, which I believe is legal um, it is, yeah. with the teams. Um, allow you to build a vertical slide just that you see here. Produces a tremendous amount of power, and depending on the PWM, and Kyle can get more, as I hit you in the head there, Kyle can get more into the driving of the PWM, but actually this servo can actually run this mechanism the entire length of this slide. Um, the CETO slides work great in lighter duty application. There may be a situation we might want to run twin uh, uh, parallel with one another in order to be able to uh, uh, make your robot or pick a, pick a heavy object up. So, um, but it's very easy to build. Um, of course, we have all the mechanisms online in order to do this. So, but basically it consists of a pulley system, uh, a, a 0.2 pitch belt, and of course your seat of slide, which we offer different ones. And of course you can configure the slide any, any, any uh, uh, configuration you want, so. And uh, the last thing, we were talking about the CAD files on this. Sorry. Uh, they're not available on those slides, but uh, I guess we do have dimensions on the website. So if you guys want to create those right quick in your program, and uh, kind of remodel those yourselves. That sounds like it might be the best option right now. Certainly. Um, let's see what else we have here. We have one question, and we get this quite a bit. What is the best drivetrain option? Sprockets and chain, gears, belts, pulley systems. Uh, once again, we don't want to be vague, but we can kind of go into the positive and negatives of each. 
Uh, basically, gear drive systems are, and jump in here if you guys have any have any input. I know you do, but gear drive systems are extremely robust. They're very, very reliable, and they're very compact. You can obviously run gears close to one another. Um, belt drive systems are very good as far as being very smooth. If you're trying to go from point A to point B and you don't want any slack in between, especially on a tooth belt drive system, very good. Many of you have probably seen belt drive systems used on 3D printers uh, for that very fact that they're very, very accurate. Uh, you do run that risk in a heavy robot build of belts jumping a tooth. Um, a lot of the new Kevlar belts now, you can stretch them extremely tight. And so they are become extremely reliable even in heavy duty application and sometimes you can even double them up side by side depending on your pulleys, pulley mechanism. Um, chain drive, a lot of... Sorry, oh, go ahead. neoprene with fiberglass. Neoprene oh, with fiberglass, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, chain drive is a, is a fantastic option as well. We offer both plastic chain which, which which works extremely well. In a competition format, I wouldn't highly recommend plastic chain just because the, the braking strength is right around, uh, per foot is around 50 pounds, I believe. Well, we had a video of Laura, or maybe a picture um, of Laura hanging from the chain. And she was <laughs> almost off the ground and then it busted. So uh, it's pretty stout, but it won't hold Laura up. And uh, you saw her <laughs> at the beginning of the video. So, I mean, plastic chain or chain drives is a great option, especially if you need to go a long distance. And of course, the plastic chain is great for building or testing your robot. But eventually, if you're going into competition, we recommend uh, a metal chain. Um, it, the nice thing about the plastic chain, you can take it apart, kind of configure everything exactly the way you want, and then come back and actually uh, replace it with metal chain. Obviously, there's a weight difference between the two, but the reliability of metal chain is, is much greater. Um, I don't know if that covers all the... Various Jason kind of put aspect. it simply earlier. We were talking about this, and uh, he comes from a, a very techy electronic background, background, and uh, it's a little more green on the mechanical side. But you you put it really well into well, yeah. Before words. I started working here, I I kind of liked the idea of the plastic chain. It's easy to work with, easy to prototype with. Um, but now at this point, for my money, it'd be belts all the way, um, just because it, it's a little bit more work up front. You have to calculate the length, and we'll be coming out with the tool pretty soon on the new website that's coming soon um, that will help you calculate that length easily. Um, but once you have that length down, um, it's the durability and strength and then quietness uh, is is really, really nice of going with a, a belt system. So another question that we um, had a lot of teams ask was, do Actobotics gears work with Tetrix gears? And then how can we attach Actobotics parts to their Tetrix frame? Okay, uh, I can get in and you guys jump in any time here. Obviously, we have some Tetrix and we also have some uh, 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 VEX products. The, the Tetrix line, the, the VEX product, as well as the Matrix line, they're fantastic products line, product line. Um, they, they work extremely well. Um, of course, the Actobotics line, uh, we have designed this uh, to be a little bit, I don't want to say more intuitive, but to give you more options. And of course, we get that question all the time as far as how to com how to uh, uh, join the two together. And I guess I can get into that a little bit and then we can talk about gears and how they work with the Tetrix gears as well and some of the other brand of gears. But one of the ways that you can attach them is that we've got an adapter here. Uh, it's a little six, uh, 625 or 630, uh, uh, 632 threaded adapter that allows you to adapt the 630 pattern to the 770, 770 yeah, pattern. So basically scary. all you have to do here is, I don't know if Kyle has a part number on this or not, but bolt this directly to, and I'll do it right quick here. Take me just a second here. Bear with me here, I'll try to do this quickly. While he's doing that, we're trying to get a screen share option going on the website. Um, we have a 770 to 625 hub adapter that he's actually using right now. Uh, to attach those two parts. So I was going to pull that up on the website and show you guys where it is. So you can see here, now I've got the adapter on, and now I can easily, I've got the four holes here with the Actobotics component or pattern. Now you can easily attach all of the Tetrix channel to the Actobotics channel. And as well as you can, since we have an orbital pattern, now you can also put them at a 45 degree angle or a 90 degree, degree angle or directly in line. So, and this adapter works on the inside as well as the outside of the channel. And right quick, if you guys want to get creative, you know, if you don't want to go 45 or 90 degrees, this thing has a one inch diameter. So just grab one of our one inch clamping hubs, put the one inch clamping hub on the 1.5 inch hub pattern uh, on our channel. Since we have two hub patterns, the large and the small, 
and then you could just slide those two parts together and you could rotate that wherever you need, lock it down to the pinch bolt on the clamping hub, and that thing is gonna be absolutely stuck. So that's a really good way to give you infinite adjustment between those two parts. Very good point, very good point. Um, as well as now we also have um, VEX, VEX as well will bolt directly, actually directly to the Actimotics component or the channel. Um, basically the VEX offers, obviously offers a square hole, but the outside edges uh, the square hole will line directly up to the 770 pattern in the Actibotics channel or any Actibotic component. And so now you can actually bolt VEX directly to Actibotic components. So um, it's a very, very easy way to do it. So um, as far as gears, meshing with the Tetrix gears, the Tetrix line is kind of a, a little bit of a proprietary line for the Tetrix. Um, as far as the overall dimensions and how they line up with our channel pattern, they will not. Um, and so that's one reason why we offer a huge range of various spur gears as well as pinion gears uh, in, in various bores as well. So, um, Guys, we run 32 pitch on most of our gears. Right. Uh, we have 48 pitch as well, but really we've, we've increased that line of 32 pitch quite a bit because it does work so nicely with the channel. <laughs> Um, our channel has a 0.75 inch spacing between one hole and the next hole. So you've got to have 48 teeth, 48 ah. teeth between your spur and pinion gear to get those two to line up. So as long as these two gears line up or uh, add up to 48 teeth, then you're good to go. If you skip a hole, which is probably more popular, gives you more gearing options, you've got to add up to 96 teeth. So you could go two to one, three to one, 3.8 to one, five to one or seven to one, uh, you have all those options. So really, uh, really, really nice to use with 32 pitch gears. If you guys wanna get more precise and have uh, something a little bit finer, maybe use smaller gears like 48 pitch, then you can skip, well, if you go between one hole and the next, like I was talking about with 48 teeth, in this case, it'd be 72 teeth with 48 pitch, or if you skip a hole, it's gonna be 144 teeth. So you still have all those options from two to one, all the way up to like 8.6 to one with the 48 pitch gears. If you guys want to use some of our acetal gears or the other ones that we offer on the site. And that kind of hits upon too. We get the question all the time is what, what is the advantage of the Actibotics channel over the matrix or the or Vex or, or a Tetrix. And uh, basically Actibotics is a series of overlapping hole patterns. So let me grab a piece here. So instead of having a hole pattern that basically, basically repeats right down the line, but basically the, the Actibotics channel overlaps one another. And so what that allows you to do, it allows you to offer, it, it offers a, a tremendous amount of op mounting options, as well as it gives us, obviously our channel is larger. Um, it's one and a half by one and a half, um, but also it has half inch holes. And so not only do we have a overlapping pattern, but we also have the, uh, a pattern within a pattern. So you can see here, we have our 770 pattern, which is in the center. And then we have our, we call it our, our 150 pattern, which is on the outside. And so that's that's what overlaps as well. So not only do you have a pattern that, that's right next to each other, the center hole pattern, you also have the overlapping uh, larger pattern. Cool. So what the advantages are is now, instead of building things with bushings or, or, or no bushing at all, now it allows you to start running ball bearings in channel. And so it allows you to build as the robots, everybody's building robots and we're absolutely shocked at how, how complex and how detailed and industrial the robots that everybody's building, and so the next the next step is to, is to start building everything by ball, using ball bearings to make it more precise, and so that's what allows you to do, but also allows you to also start running, whether it's half inch tube or half inch shafting directly through the channel as well. That's something you can't do with, with uh, Matrix or uh, Tetrix as well. The Tetrix has the eight mil center hole where obviously half mil is much larger, so um, it gives you that option, but plus as far as various components, now you can take any of the Actibotic components, as you can see here, you can bolt them this way at a 45 and directly in line. So not only does it give you heavier duty components, but a lot more range as far as where you want to mount those. So I, sorry, I didn't mean to drag on there. So kind no, of jump in here. When you get on the website, you're going to see a lot of different dimensions on our parts. Um, you know, we have the 0.77 pattern across center, and that's the small pattern. And then we have the 150 uh, that Brian mentioned, that's 1.5 inches across center diagonally. Now, if you go down the, the side of the channel, you know, or, or uh, anywhere on the big pattern, um, that is the side of the 1.5 inch hub pattern, which is a hypotenuse. 
um, that measures it out at 1.06 and on out. Uh, basically, a bunch of our parts have that 1.06 inch pattern. Uh, for example, I've got some bearing mounts in here, so you can see that those stand up nicely. You can put them anywhere along that channel, and they fit right in. Uh, the other thing that he talked about was the half-inch OD, quarter-inch ID bearings that go in the channel. And you can see I've got some here just behind these collars. Um, you guys, when you put those bearings in, they don't press in place. Uh, that way you can assemble and disassemble as needed. But just keep in mind that you've got to run something against that bearing so that it doesn't fall out. Um, so that's why we use our collars. And we always try to put a shim in between the collar and the bearing to further reduce <coughs> that friction. And you can see here, this might give you a good visual as far as the various size. If you can see this here, uh, the 150 pattern versus the, uh, the 770 pattern. So basically on the same hole, you can actually run either size. So, and what the advantage is obviously is now you can start running up to even one inch aluminum tubes or any of our, any of our tubing um, for very heavy duty applications. So, or heavy duty slides for that matter. So Brian, you touched on a lot of different building systems, VEX, Actobotics, um, Matrix, all those. You didn't talk about the 8020. Um, that's pretty popular. Let's let's get into that a little bit and what it is and uh, how you can make that compatible with. Well, I'm going to have Kyle kind of put something together when I, I talk about it and kind of get 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 through it here twice. But basically, as I'll give you a few po components here, is a lot of teams are starting to use 8020. 8020 is awesome. It's really really good stuff. Uh, it's pretty inexpensive. Um, it gives you a lot, of, a lot of mounting options. So one of the things we want to do is make sure that all of the Actobotic components mount to 8020. Not only our components, but also, you know, Tetrix components, Two Vex screws. components. Oh, let me pass some screws to them here. Give them a tool here. Thank you. Um, any of the components you already exist, you, are, you, you, you already have, we want to make sure that you can utilize those components, not go to waste, and so you can bolt those right to 8020. And so basically the first item we came up with first two items, I should say, are new little, uh, we call them 8020 uh, mounts. And so you can see here, hopefully you can see here, the long mount actually has five 632 tap holes. You can utilize this with our 770 and our 15 pattern. And so it allows you to bolt channel, which Kyle's gonna do here, he's gonna bolt the gearbox right to 8020, as well as these little singular units. And so the singular units will just simply slide in, like a lot of other 8020 mounts, they'll simply slide in and now you can actually take your Tetrix and slide two of them in right next to each other. So I slide them in here. And I won't actually, Kyle's already built something there, but I'll just show you on the, you can actually take your Tetrix, bolt it directly to your 8020. You can actually utilize the orbital pattern here and bolt it at an angle, 90 degrees, or directly in line, as well as your VEX now. You can actually bolt your VEX directly in line with 8020. These super cheap little mounts, um, so I would recommend if you guys are utilizing 8020 in your project, certainly pick some of those up because the, the options it gives you are, are vast. So as well as what's really cool is we can actually take our, and I don't really have one here, but, or excuse me, one of our hubs like this, now you can clamp this hub down. Now, like what Kyle said, now you can take one of the one inch um, uh, mounts and actually clamp it on. So now you can infinitely adjust where where that goes. So I'll get I'll let Kyle kind of show you what he's done there. Okay. I just kind of held this up a minute ago. Um, basically I took the the long mount that we offer since it already has that 1.06 pattern that I was talking about. I ran two screws down through the channel into that mount and uh, basically as soon as you screw those things down it clamps on there and you're not going to be able to move this thing. Um, if you want to slide it down a little bit, you just loosen those screws, slide it down to where you want, and tighten them back up. So it's nice. It holds it very square to the 8020. Um, we've made the part so it fits just below the deck height of the 8020. So really, it uh, it creates some tension on those screws, so they're not going to back out on you on your robot when you're driving it around. Um, they're pretty well locked in place when you screw those down. So as you can see, I mean, it's very easy to integrate Actobotics with all your existing components, even 8020, Matrix, Tetrix, Vex, any of the any of the components you you currently have or, or existing components. So, anything else? Yeah, I think we just got another question in. Um, can the mini channel be used in a linear slide configuration with the regular size channel? Do you need any special connectors or parts to do that? Well. It, yes and no. I wish we had it. We should have some mini Laura's channel here. Oh, mini Laura, channel. Laura's uh, running a gopher here and getting us some mini channel. But yeah, there's lots of different ways you could do that. Uh, certainly the mini channel is, depending on the, the amount of weight you're wanting to use to slide, 
Um, there's some limitations there, but the mini channel will line up. Thank you very much. Kyle's got a piece here. The mini channel will line up with the 770 pattern right directly in the channel. So you could run it inside the channel, on the side, in, on the side, on the inside of the channel, or on the back side of the channel as well. Um, but we don't have any acetyl or any slides that work with the mini channel at this time. So that's something you guys might have to 3D, 3D print or create on your own. I can't think of any other parts that may work with it. But the mini channel, we're starting to develop a lot of parts for the mini channel. So that's not to say we don't have some stuff coming down the pipeline. It could certainly be, be watching the site because I know that we do. So, but nothing at this time that will bolt right to the mini channel or connect to the mini channel to build any particular type of slides. So with Kyle, Kyle's got one option here for you as well. I know there's a lot of Heavier, a lot beefier than the mini channel. Uh, one of the coolest things that we have on the 8020 is going to be our uh, wheels. And basically, these B wheels fit right down in the 8020 channel. Um, so I'm going to have a servo on there. You can put about any Xbox part on top of there. Uh, it, it, lines it lines up perfectly with, uh, with our channel. channel. You just want to get these channels. Channel, channel, channel has been having all of this all stuff, this stuff on, on, on and, and the things that they really it's really good. Good. You have to rock, 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 rock to it. Uh, you can adjust, adjust these just tiny bits. bits. You, you have, have to rock, rock, rock and move them, them screws in just a little, little, bit, little bit, bit to uh, get, get, rid of, rid of, get rid of get rid of any of that. It's a lot, a lot. It's a pretty cool pretty setup cool. there. And it's also, also not only the not only little, little uh, adapters, but also the neat thing about that about the channels now is some standoffs stand for some spacers and standoffs. Stand now you can bolt my little mini V roller wheels directly, so you don't need any adapters that you're utilizing the channel. And now they'll actually bolt right on. You just have to bolt to find the right hole. Very, very stout setup. And of course, then you can come in the back side and support it on the back side as well with another plate. That way, you don't have any, you can torque the part or you can torque the, the framework and it won't, uh, it will uh, remain very rigid so but uh works really really well with the 8020 so be sure to check those out and moving on we also had a question as far as let's see here well i'll jump in while but, brian's yep. searching um back to the servo related we've got one question somebody said uh, how much torque do the various servos produce that's pretty wide open. Um, there are servos that produce, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten ounces of tor torque. They're uh, or ounce inches, I should say. They're very, very tiny servos, uh, primarily used in RC helis and airplanes. Um, and then we have some all the way up to 600, 650 ounce inches of torque. Titanium gears, um, they're absolute hogs. So you've got a pretty good range that you can use there. And it looks like we also got some questions regarding the motors as far as obviously there's some brand new motors on the market. Andy Mark, uh, some of their never rest motors, which are fantastic. We use a lot of them here. Great, great motors. Of course, they've got an awesome encoder on the back. And so we, we, we absolutely love these motors. So uh, certainly if you don't have any of these, pick some up because they are, they are fantastic. Nice thing is, and Kyle can kind of reiterate a little bit, but we offer several different mounts for these motors. A lot of people didn't know if we had any you know, mounts that would work with the Neverrest and or the Tetrix uh, motors, and so we do. Obviously, the Andy Mark and the Tetrix motors are 37 mil OD. They also share the same bolt pattern. Of course, the, the bolt pattern is going directly across. And so we offer several different motor mounts. Um, obviously, this is a clamping one here, so you can actually bolt it directly onto channel like this or in line or even an angle. Of course, then you have the motor mount here, which of course you can see there's multiple holes in all the different motor mounts, especially the ones that are running in line. And so they'll, they'll offer, you know, the, basically any, 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 this, any motor this size will be able to bolt right to it. Brian has so, motor mount B there. I think uh, we're trying to get this pulled up on the website for uh, you guys to look at. Um, basically, you know, there are two very similar ones. He's got motor mount B. I've got another one here. Um, his has screws that go straight into the face. Uh, so you can see that 1.5 inch hub pattern there. I have another style that uh, if you grab some channel, I'm gonna grab this gearbox again, you can slide it right into the channel. So it also has the 1.5 inch hub pattern, but it's along the side that we can drop it in, you know, and have that shaft perfectly in line with the channel going down the center. If you guys wanna do like some sort of a Acme drive or something like that with it, uh, that would be a good option. Um, Brian's option would go into the, the side of the channel through a half inch hole. That's also going to be perfectly concentric with that half inch hole. So you guys could put a coupler on there 
and then put a quarter inch shaft on the other side of the coupler if you want to drive something. For example, if you want to build this system and not utilize a 785 servo, you would simply grab this motor mount here. Cool thing is now you have an encoder on the back. So now you can bolt this directly in, bolt your pulley right on. And now you can actually build this. Of course, this is longer than 18 inches, but you could actually build this uh, a linear actuator and or, or linear slide utilizing a never rest or and or a Tetrix motor. So very, very, very useful. So basically we kind of cover the whole basis on a motor mount. So there's just about probably not a motor mount that we don't make that allow you to bolt uh, any of these motors to any of the components. So. Yeah. One question we get a lot too is what parts are legal and I'll let Kyle kind of handle this because he gets that question quite often. So okay, yeah, I'm answering a lot of your tech emails as they come in. So keep them coming. Uh, I enjoy seeing what you're building, seeing uh, what questions you have about our parts. A lot of times that'll tell us we need more info on the website when you guys do send the questions in. Uh, basically my understanding and definitely go to the forum on this. Don't take my word for it, but my understanding is Almost any of the mechanical parts are legal. Uh, you can grab any of the channel, any of the shafting, hubs, couplers, adapters, you name it. You can bolt them on your robot and use them however you guys want. Um, we touched on the servos, the 485 and all those. Uh, basically any high-tech servo, it's my understanding that um, they're all legal. As long as you don't modify them uh, by cutting, soldering, you know, uh, <coughs> anything like that. So. Our analog servos that we have the 180 option definitely don't use those. If you need to get 180, go to a digital instead of using that analog and then program it with the servo controller. Uh, HFP25 servo controller is by far my favorite to use. It's going to be good for a servo tester when you guys are out in the field or in the pits working on your robot. Uh, it just works really, really nicely. So it's it's pretty open this year. Okay. Another question we get all the time are. 45 servos are the servos that are legal in FTC, uh, the number of different servos. Obviously, when you're trying to hang a lot of weight off of the servos, the servos have a lot of power, but as far as when you're trying to uh, run a load on them, they don't work very well. So sometimes you're in a situation where you have to run two servo shafts in together in line and be able to put your weight there, but still you run into a lot of issues. So what we've developed is advice and many of the teams out there usually call servo blocks. So basically, it's a servo exoskeleton utilizing ball bearing. So I'll show you here. We offer a couple different versions. Um, one here is a servo block with the hub already mounted on the end. It's integrated in with the shaft. And here we have a 45 with one that you can actually just clamp on. So that way it allows you to index any of the clamping hubs directly onto the shaft like this. And then of course they'll bolt directly into the channel. As you can see here, and Kyle can probably get one up and going here. This is a system built out of 785, so it's multi, obviously 785s are multi-rotation. This thing can go just about any direction. But the neat thing about servo blocks, it builds, it allows you to build some extremely rigid, basically on the verge of industrial. Um, so you can actually take this device here and just try to crank on it any direction, and it's very, very strong. So, um, and of course, you can bolt them directly onto shafts, whatever you want. Yeah, here we go. Here's Going back to the gearbox here. again. But uh, as you can see, I bolted the channel right onto the servo block. You can move that thing around. I'm using the HFP25 servo programmer, um, which doesn't give you quite the range that your modern robotics controller would, given the signal that I'm sending. But you can see that thing's nice and stout. This thing, I mean, go ahead and push on that. You can, you can push on. down on it, and it won't it won't yeah. budge. Um, it's got an external large half-inch diameter or half-inch ID external ball bearing. So the servo is not taking, well, it's taking a very, very light side load where the ball bearing is taking the majority of the side load. So, yeah. But the nice thing is, too, not only that, you get a very rigid platform, but now you have really cool mounting options for your servo. So now you can come in and you can bolt it on the end of a tube or a shaft, or of course you can bolt one to another so you can build a, a, a system like this. Um, but also that's not the only other option. The neat thing about the Actibotics channel is now you can actually build a system directly in line with your channel. So now you can see here we just have a small quarter inch shaft with a hub, ball bearing in the channel, shaft to servo coupler, and one of our servo mounts and a little 485 in here. So now you've got a very rigid platform. So now if you wanted to mount a sprocket or something like that on here, very easy to do. So um, once again, the incorporating the ball bearings with the channel is 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 one of the key aspects of the Actibotics line. So 
We just had a question come through on uh, what charger do I recommend for the servo programmer? That would be the HFP25 programmer. We have quite a few different chargers available. Uh, basically, you could just use a, uh, a standard charger that comes with like a, a transmitter and receiver. Yes. And uh, most of those are going to have a female connection on them. So mm -hmm. if you get a male-to-male -male servo lead, you can plug right into that uh, connection and then run your other lead right into the side of those ports. Uh, you'll see in the back of this, if I can get the, the case off, that is just a standard old receiver battery uh, that they used to use for flying RC airplanes. You still see them some, but uh, they use LiPos a lot more uh, these days. So the, uh, the 3.6 to 7.2 volt uh, NICAT or NIMI charger, it charges both. That's a nice little overnight charger that we have on the website. Um, so if you don't have a radio system charger, then check that one out. Uh, it does have a Tamiya connector on it, so if you're handy with soldering, just cut that off, put a male servo lead on the end of it. You'll only use two of three of those wires, um, or you can use an adapter to go from the Tamiya to a male servo lead to charge this. We've also had a couple teams ask what's special about the 785 HB servo. All right. I'll get into that. It's, <clears throat> it's awesome. Yeah, it's a sweet servo. Um, it's a lot different than any of the other servos I talked about earlier because it rotates multiple turns and it has positioning feedback. Uh, it's a quarter scale, so it's a larger size, uh, larger case th size than standard, but if you can fit it in, then it's fantastic. Um, this servo rotates about 1.7 degrees per microsecond change on your controller, so you guys can do the math and figure out exactly how far it's going to rotate with your modern robotics controller, whichever controller you're using. So how, how many rotations could you get the output shaft to rotate? Well, max rotation out of the servo itself, so that would be on this brass gear on the power gearbox, would be about eight turns, and that would be with a 600 to 2400 signal. Uh, that's going to be real close to eight turns. Um, you know, it's uh, it's an analog servo, so it's fairly robust. doesn't uh, doesn't generate a lot of like chirping noise that you get with some of the digitals. Um, it's not going to pull quite as much power as a digital equivalent. If they ever do come out with a um, a multi-turn digital servo, that's kind of a hint for high tech. I hope they do sometime soon. Um, what else? Well, tell me. I mean, obviously, it's mounted in a gearbox. Can you explain that a little bit and how yeah. that that kind of yeah, so this is called a channel mount servo power gearbox. Uh, you might look at this and think, well, how is that going to be legal with FTC? Um, we've not modified the servo in any way. There's, there's no cut wires or uh, external potentiometer or anything like that. All we've done is put four screws in this power gearbox to hold it in place, or, or into the servo, rather. And then we've got this external gear ratio here. Uh, this, tends to, or this happens to be a five to one ratio. So this servo output shaft has to rotate five turns to get one turn out of this large gear here. So, so you can get a proportional 360. Exactly. Yeah, you can get well over 360 with a 5 to 1. You can still get 360 with a 7 to 1 if your signal allows. Uh, so any of the ones that we offer from 2 to 1 to 7 to 1 will do that 360 if you need. Um, it increases the torque a ton. I think this servo has 183 ounce inches of torque. Um, if you put a 7 to 1 ratio on there, it would be 183 times 7, uh, which I don't know right off the top of my head, but it's a ton of torque. Um, you've isolated all the load off of the servo, or almost all of the load. You know, it's on a large half-inch shaft that runs through, through this bearing, or through this uh, power gearbox, and there are two bearings that are taking all that load. So, um, you know, if you had this on a platform, you could make a turntable and, and probably set on top of it or so you can on top you can put it. that right in like the channel or it'll yeah. hold in. Or. Yeah. Um, so it slides right into the channel. The width is 1.32 inches, which happens to be the inside width of the channel. So you can bolt it in that way. You can stand it up. You can stand it up by its end. Uh, just tons of different mounting options. So. You know, even if you don't need a power gearbox, sometimes I go to these because the mounting is so vast inside of the channel. Uh, you can just throw a servo in and, and build very quickly. And then uh, I guess it's smaller counterpart, the SPG400A-CM. That's a standard size servo power gearbox. So um, any of your standard size servos would fit. Um, I have a 2645CR servo in this because um, unless you really want to limit your rotation, 
you've got to have a servo that's going to rotate more than 180. You know, let's say for example, I grab a 485 and it does 180 with my controller, and then I throw a five to one ratio on here. The output shaft is only going to rotate like 36 degrees, uh, so it's not very far. It'd be really, really precise and it'd have the torque, but it's probably not going to be far enough to work for many applications. Um, the continuous rotation servo, because it has no endpoints, uh, it can rotate without bounds as many times as it wants to, then it fits right in here and it's going to be a good way to multiply torque um, out of this servo. And that's another thing. I know you guys have a limited number of amps that you guys can use uh, through your modern robotics controller in order to be FTC legal. Um, if you're happy with this servo but it just doesn't give you enough torque, then you can put this gear ratio on here with the gearbox and increase your torque without increasing your, your current draw. And actually it's gonna decrease it because it's taking load off of it. So that would be a, a really good thing to use for it. Um, one of the other questions that we get a little, is on here as well is, what's our favorite part and what do you think that most people use or take advantage of? And I would have to say uh, probably probably servo blocks are, are a huge, uh, huge item that uh, a lot of teams use and teams Teams, I think, absolutely love them just for the fact that they're how rigid they are and what they allow them to do in a compact setting. So, uh, we'll just go down the row. I'm going to say the dual ball bearing mount. Uh, <coughs> you guys can pull that up on the website, then we need to take a look at this. Uh, Brian makes fun of me for it. I use this dual ball bearing mount for everything. Um, you can throw it inside the channel, outside the channel. Basically, I like it so much because the bearings are, are pressed in place. Uh, dual ball bearing hub. Can you guys? <laughs> so they're pressed in place. You're not going to get any wiggle or any wobble in the bearings. Uh, they're, they're very solid in that structure. And then the other thing is you can run a shaft through that. And that shaft's going to be very, uh, very rigid because you have your bearings spread out a little bit and it's going to take any of that, uh, that side loading out to where you're not going to see much movement there at the end of the shaft. Jason, what, uh, what would you use if you had to pick one part? Well, I don't know if I could pick one part, but yeah. um, I think sort of an unsung hero are standoffs. Lightweight, strong, and, and yeah. like people underestimate what you can do with them. That's true. Yeah. That's very true. So, Is there a length <laughs> that you would gravitate towards? Uh, probably 1.32. Okay. Yeah. And reason being on that? Because it fits nicely inside the channel. Um, it'll drop right inside there and, and make your channel much more rigid. But if you just had a bucket of those, you can use it for a ton of other purposes as well. You could take two channels and, and nice mount sure. them parallel to each other. Um, you could do a lot with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the channel being the open side, you know, you can flex it a little bit if you really try to. If you had the 1.32 standoff in here, um, it's basically going to box that channel. So it's going to be really, really solid. Uh, so if you guys are getting some flex on your robots, throw the 1.32 standoffs in. Um, you can run, you know, like a 3 8 inch screw into that and uh, it's going to work out. Now, a lot of you, uh, uh, and I don't mean to jump around a little bit, a lot of you are trying to build or in the process or have built um, uh, some slides. And so I'll talk maybe just a, real quick on slides and whatever input you guys have as well. But one of the questions we get all the time are, you know, what's the best way to build a slide? Myself, I really like building them with linear ball bearings. Uh, right here I have an 8 mil, 8 mil long shaft. Linear bearings clamped in various various mounts here with our uh, 15 mil clamps. So it allows you to build a very smooth, very rigid system. Obviously, we have a couple systems built here in line, and of course, a dual sided system here. Now, the question really comes down to, well, how do I how do I make this thing elevate, go up, and then click up again, uh, just like that? Well, I don't. I hate to be vague, but there's a lot of different ways to do it. The way that we tend to like to do things, obviously, are with, with belt drives. So and the next question is, well, how do I clamp or how do I make this thing go up with my belt drive? So it's one of the reasons why we have a little belt mount here. So the way this works is basically it will pinch your belt. So if I have a piece of channel here, I can put my belt in this way. And of course, this is stainless steel and it's tapped. So now it will pinch the belt. There you go. They're showing a picture up there, I think, right now. So you can rotate it. Rotate it any way, 45 degrees in line, any way you want, but also you can flip the belt over the other direction, as well as now you can actually take the like a hub and bolt it into that part now. So now basically you kind of have a mount that's ready to go already on the on the belt. So now you can start incorporating that into your slide mechanism like this. So if you take this part right here, 
bolt it down in your slide, run it up over a pulley system with your motor at the base. As you begin to pull this up, it's going to start to raise your system here. So belts, I tend to gravitate a little bit more toward belts. There's obviously a lot of different ways to do it with, with threaded drives and Acme rod as well, which is a, which is a great way to do it um, also. A lot of pe people use string and pulleys also for that. Um, you know, if you use a string and pulley, you, you need to drive it up. And then, um, you know, if you guys are grabbing onto something and trying to pull it back the other way, I don't know, um, you can wrap that pulley both ways. So it's kind of like a sailboat. If you've ever been on a sailboat or taken a look at it, um, you know, they wrap those pulleys both directions to where they can pull something either direction. Um, one thing on the belts, you know, we have a lot of questions that come through the tech line. Uh, people are concerned that we're selling belting by the foot. So we've got this length of belt. Well, how do I bring these two ends back together and join them so that I can make a continuous loop <clears throat> and make that thing run around and around? That's not really the intention of belting by the foot when it's cut. We do have continuous belt loops if you guys want to do a drive system or something like that with it. Um, you can bring those two ends together and you can clamp them with the belt clamp that's shown on the website. Um, but, you know, if you consider like a slide, that belt's never going to make one full rotation. You know, it's going to go down to the end, and the two ends of the belt are right under this, uh, this hub adapter right here. So it can go to either end, but it doesn't have to go all the way around. So a lot of linear drives, you'll never see that belt go all the way around and need a, a, a nice seamless joint in between those two. Throw some together here as well, not to jump back to the linear slides, but one of the advantages of the Actibotics channel is now with a large hole, center hole, on a, one, or a, a, a 770 or 75 pattern, is now you can run, you can build slides and actually have channel uh, run perpendicular or actually in line with longer channels. So very, very easy to do, so. We had a question just come through about hollow shafts for linear bearings. Um, so we've got all these solid shafts that we're showing you guys right now. Uh, primarily eight and twelve are the two that we use. Um, it makes it a little bit heavy, you know. If you guys are trying to reach out and grab onto something, uh, it makes makes the front of the robot very heavy. We are going to come out with hollow shafts, uh, or at least I think we are for. Um, 12 mil and I don't know about eight. Brian, can you? We're, we're working there? on both. We're working on both eight and 12. So uh, as far as a release date on those, we're not quite quite sure. Um, to be able to run a really stout stainless steel hollow shaft and have it perfectly round for linear ball bearings to to run smoothly is not an easy process. So um, there's a lot of testing involved, as I'm sure you guys can appreciate. So, but uh, we're working really hard on that right now. So. And you might be able, be able to find that somewhere out on the web. Um, you know, just make sure that the shafting has that final grind process. If you go out to McMaster or some hardware store and pick up a piece of shafting, um, you may think you're buying a half inch piece of shaft or a quarter inch or whatever it may be, but it's a little bit oversized. So it's not gonna fit in a bearing, it's not gonna fit in a clamp, it's not gonna fit in a linear bearing. Um, so make sure if you go to another vendor, but that final grind process has been done on the shafting that you use so that everything slides smoothly. Okay, very good. Um, another team asked, um, they've had a terrible experience lining up two linear bearings to make a quarter inch steel rod move smoothly left to right. Um, what tips do you have for both the design of a dual ball bearing system and techniques to ensure they're aligned in the channel? <clears throat> Not sure I understand with quarter inch. We've got eight and twelve for the linear bearings. Was it was it a question on linear bearings? No. Um, yeah, it says. Brian, maybe you better understand this. Okay, well, one more time, if you could repeat that. We've had terrible experience lining up two linear bearings to make a rod move smoothly left to right. Ah, okay. Yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. Well, basically, when you have parts like this. Basically, we have our linear bearings right here. This is this is the eight mil, obviously. And so, when you're running back and forth, if you have two of them like this that we show how to do, lining these things up that way, it can take a really high side load and not run and run very smooth. Well, what we've done is we've now that's that's one application. We, the reason why we had these so you can spread them out a little bit, but we have a new linear bearing, and I will show you here. Let me grab one here. If I can find it here. Well, it's around. We're getting so many parts on the table here. Let's see here. 
Well, Brian, if you go to our website, oh are. yes, thank you very much. Hi, hi, you right in front of me. So basically, you can utilize two of them, as you can see on the website there, or we actually have our longer version here. They actually have dual sets inside, already lined up, ready to be able. To, that way, it runs extremely smooth. As you can see here, I can barely tilt this, and it runs very smooth. So. Yeah, we, you know, the, the, the singular units that, uh, well, right in front of me here, work great in, in applications where you need something very compact or you need to actually run that linear ball bearing inside channel this way, directly or parallel, I guess you'd say, or perpendicular to your, to your shaft. So that works great, but yes, you're correct. When you need to run two of them in line, it does take a little finagling to line them up. It, it, it will line up okay, especially make sure you do put a little bit of oil in the bearings because they do come pre-oiled, but... But during shipping, things like that, some of that oil can leak out. But I would recommend picking up. They're not very expensive. Some of our units here, um, and we should have de developed these right off the bat, but we didn't. But um, our, our our dual systems that are already in line. So hopefully that answers that question. So all right. Another question is, what are some of the new parts you've recently come out with, um, specifically the the channel panels or the channel plates? Um, tell us a little bit about those and the pattern. Yeah, we just threw something together here right quick, but basically we have some brand new channel plates. We have three different sizes, a, a, a version that's half this size here, long version here, and our big, big panel here. These are fantastic when you need to have a, well, you guys can jump in here as I, I, I ramble on, but a fantastic base and we're, we wish to bolt various parts on, whether it's servos, whether it's shafting. It works great as far as uh, if you're needing, if you're bringing uh, items in on a playing field, they have them on a on a set set uh, platform to be able to pull up into into a robot. So a great, great platform, and of course they all line up. The channel pattern um, it allows you to bolt any of the Actibotic components on at an angle, 90 degree. Of course, even the smaller parts, um, all of the hubs can bolt even in between all the various patterns like this. If I can see myself on there, so. Um, so, and they can bolt directly on the size in line, um, but a very, very popular, very popular product. So I don't know if you've got anything to add to that. Well, uh, a few things, same wall thickness as your channel. Um, so if you throw a channel on the, the side or something like that, it's gonna feel the same as far as thickness goes. Uh, you'll notice that the holes are spread out a little bit further than on the channel. And uh, you know, this is a 1.5 inch distance in between those two instead of a 0.75 inch. And the main reason we've done that, you know, if, if we just perforated this whole thing with the, the half inch holes, you know, that were very close together, it'd start to get a little bit weak because it is just a, you know, a single plane. Um, if you have a C channel or something like that, then it gets very robust because you do have those corners. You know, we've, we've got uh, three planes on there that are really making it strong. But on this, that's why those holes are not there. But we still find it really useful, uh, whether you're running gears or uh, just, you know, mounting an Arduino board or circuit board. Uh, Jason's actually got a project that he's been working on here, and, and he uses the channel panels quite a bit. Or yeah, I'm a big fan of the uh, channel plates. Um, so this is a setup I've been using um, to mount uh, Raspberry Pi and the seven uh, inch Raspberry Pi touchscreen, which happens to line up with our channel plates perfectly out of the box. Um, and here's the, the next uh, generation of that for a project we're working on right now. So it's really convenient to have all the space to mount uh, your electronics and motors and whatever else you're working with, all your sensors. Phone mount. But, um, yeah, you're, you're, it makes a really nice control panel. You have room for switches and lights and stuff like that. So. It's, it's a really great uh, addition to the lineup. Jason, I know you've got some grommets through there and then also some switches. How did you put those on? Um, well, the, the grommets down here, um, I like to use as feet on projects, um, and those just uh, press through. Um, and these switches um, happen to fit through the, the, the large hole nicely. A lot of your switches out there have a 12 mil diameter uh, where that nut goes down on. Uh, 12 mil is just under a half inch, so you slide it right through, put the nut back on, and that's going to hold the switch in place. And then we've got, we have the rubber grommets that you see here. It's nice for uh, vibration dampening, you know, if you have something that you really need to isolate. Uh, but we also have some plastic grommets that are exactly a half inch, and uh, they're right on the corner here. Nice thing is those things clip in place, and they're very, very solid. Uh, don't take up a lot of real estate, so those are, are pretty sweet for um, 
wiring and just making sure everything's clean. Uh, appearance is a lot on, on robots as well mm -hmm. as functionality. And so. it keeps your wires from rubbing on a hard edge. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So you're not going to strip your wires out. One of the questions we've got is, will you guys ever develop lead screw type components? And that's a very relevant question because those are on their way. So exactly when, but uh, I'm, I'm told that those will be on the site within days. So um, we've got some uh, really neat components uh, coming down the pipeline. So be sure to be checking the website out for those because those, those are on the way. So. You want to give them a little details on the lead screw or just kind of? Well, I won't, I, well, I won't be vague, but they'll be eight millimeter OD. Um, and of course we have all, of course we'll be active on it, uh, based. And so that's going to allow you to run all kinds of different leads down channel on the outside of channel. Um, you know, we, we've been working on those for quite some time and we wanted to get those just right because for those that, um, are not building robots that are building 3d printers, we wanted to make them just like all the active components, very precise. And so that's one of the things that we, whenever we're developing parts, and that's several of the questions here is, you know, how fast we come out with parts. And that's, that's the name of the game for us because we play with this stuff all day long. Some of us uh, well into the night. And so our goal is to come out with the coolest, neatest, most innovative parts we possibly can. And so sometimes we get very frustrated because there's so many ideas in our head and we get a lot of, a lot of input from, from teams out there that say, hey boy, if we had this, we had that. And so we're, it's like a race for us to develop all those parts, but also make sure that when they are released, that they work extremely well and they're adaptable with everything else, so. Kind of building <laughs> off of that, Brian, uh, we had a team ask, will you be coming out with any new worm gear items in the near future? Yes, yes. So uh, I don't know what else to say about that, but yeah, we're working on worm, worm drive systems right now that will actually go inside the channel and the side worm systems um, basically in channel, it's ball bearing supported, so. Worms are kind of fun with the channel because you got to figure out how to adjust your mesh just perfectly. You know, we've got a worm drive gearbox um, out on the website that you can adjust and, and really fine tune that to make it just right. But, uh, you know, it's important that you slide your motor over and lock it in place to where there's not a lot of gap in between the worm and the worm gear. Um, but sounds like we do have a good solution coming for you. Yep. So. Okay, uh, another question we have is, why did you guys become engineers? Or more importantly, how and when did you find your passion? Go for it. Oh boy, I'll, I'll, cut, it, I'll cut mine pretty short, but I've, I've been playing with mechanical stuff my entire life. Um, uh, obviously, I started out playing with Legos since I was you know, probably three, probably was eating Legos at that time. But, uh, but I absolutely love building things. When I was in junior high, I used to build built a little car called an amp eater that we get in and ride up and down the hallways of the, of the junior high and the high school so it's it's definitely in my blood i'm not an engineer by trade i've got a business uh, business degree but i love to tinker and believe it or not i'm inspired by you know coming to some of the competitions that I actually see and all the robots that are being built so um that's it for me i mean i live i live in uh, i live this stuff so uh, if i wasn't doing this i don't know what i'd be doing so Mine, uh, I think I've broken so many things in the past that I had to fix it uh, on my own. You know, I grew up riding four-wheelers and motorcycles, and I'd crash them and uh, try to fix them on my own, maybe weld parts back together, whatever. So I was always turning wrenches, uh, loved doing it. You know, there were times when I didn't know if I liked it or not, but when I, when I got the thing running, I loved it again. So uh, it's just a ton of fun coming into work and, and building things and, and playing with these I don't want to say toys, but you know, it's, we've got this huge toy box of parts that we get to come play with every day. Well, I have a background in web design and development, and I've always appreciated um, uh, playing around and being in the juxtaposition between design and, and engineering. Um, so design and science and design and uh, anything like that. So it's that kind of like the, the left brain, right brain thing. So I was a programmer and designer at the same time, and I really enjoyed that, but I decided I wanted to get into Robotics is a hobby, and so I started building uh, uh, robots and entering them into Servo City contests, and that's actually how I ended up getting a job here is by winning a few of the contests and uh, realizing that uh, I lived close enough um, that we could come and visit a few times um, and ended up uh, getting the job. Awesome. So, well, once again, and I'll, as Laura jumps in here, I just want to say we, we love seeing everybody's robots, so keep pictures coming, keep the questions coming. Uh, we love to see that type of stuff because that's what inspires us to see how innovative 
all the robots are and the engineering that all of you are doing. So please keep that coming because trust me, when we come in at eight o'clock in the morning, um, we love getting those pictures and we talk about the pictures and what people are building. So please keep those coming. So. Well, hey guys, just I kind of want to reiterate what Brian said, but thanks so much for joining us for our first live uh, Google Hangout with First Teams. We're going to have more in the future, so be sure to keep uh, posted with our newsletter. We'll always let you guys know when we're coming out with new stuff and when our next Hangout is. Um, just as a kind of thank you for joining us, we're giving away two snack packs today. So, uh, Michael Wilson, uh, you and your team won one, and then um, Rory Birch, you and your team. So, we'll be sure to give you guys a Holy cow. <laughs> you think I have you guys better be ready, so. Yeah, they are loaded with all kinds of goodies, and I have to keep them hidden so these guys wouldn't be known. So, um, thanks again for joining us. This will be live on YouTube and afterwards for me. So, if you guys have questions, uh, you can email us, and you can ask any ideas that you guys give us to us. Yeah, he's got an email, and I'll be happy to meet you. So, thanks again, and good luck, and as always, happy building.